all-inclusive vacations make life easy with endless eats, bottomless drinks, and never-ending fun. So booking an all-inclusive vacation should be easy too, right? That's where Apple Vacations comes in. Book your all-inclusive getaway with Apple Vacations and receive exclusive perks at select resorts. You'll find the best deals at Ryu Hotels and Resorts in Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central America. And enjoy a selection of exclusive nonstop vacation flights. Turn on easy mode at applevacations.com or call your local travel advisor to get started. Visit applevacations.com or call your local travel advisor to get started. Hi, it's Gabby Reese, and this podcast is powered by Laird Superfood. It was created in our kitchen by my husband, big wave surfer Laird Hamilton, and it all started with a simple idea. What began as Laird's secret for long-lasting energy on the waves is now Laird Superfood, offering a full range of delicious plant-based creamers, coffee, greens, and more. Visit LairdSuperfood.com and use the code GABBY2024 and save 20% on your first order. It's time for a Big Blue Kickoff Live. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it because you're dead. On Giants.com. You know what I saw? New York Giant Prime. And the Giants mobile app. 17-14 is the final. One touchdown, we are world champions. Believe it, and it will happen. Part of the Giants Podcast Network. Let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. Have some fun. Welcome to Wednesday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live here on Giants.com as well as the mobile app. He's Paul Dottino. I'm Lance Meadow. With you for the next 60 minutes, it's presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football Giants. Multiple ways you can interact with us here on the program. You give us a ring, 201-939-4513. You can also hit us up on Giants chat using the hashtag, of course, prior to that. And you can also send in your comments directly to us. At Lance Meadow, one word, last name, M-E-D-O-W. He is at Giants W-F-A-N. A reminder, you can find the archive of this show and our entire podcast network on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere, and at Giants.com slash podcast. So Howard Cross and I were on yesterday's program. We had reviewed the latest transactions. Since then, the Giants have made three additions. So I want to start there, and then, Paul, we could get some reaction from you in terms of what has already transpired. But... The Giants, they added a veteran quarterback, and you and I, we did two shows, right, on that position alone. Yes, we did. Joe Shane made sure to point this out before the offseason even started. They have to address the position in some capacity. So Tyrod Taylor winds up signing with the Jets to back up Aaron Rodgers. So he was no longer an option to come back. But they got Drew Locke, who was on the Seahawks roster last year, has had some fill-in opportunities for Geno Smith. He actually got into the Giants game on Monday Night Football this past season and actually played very well when Geno was sidelined for a little bit, including a short touchdown pass that Seattle had in the first half. He started his career with Denver. So here's an individual that fits the bill of what I was talking about. You want to bring in somebody that has several years of experience, but also has many starts under his belt. 23 starts over his five seasons in the league with Denver and Seattle. And interestingly, I mean, this is just a little bit of a nugget, The Giants now have two members of the 2019 draft class on the roster because Drew Locke was part of the same draft class as Daniel Jones. He was 42nd overall in the second round. And, of course, Daniel Jones was 6th overall. But certainly Locke is an individual, like I said, that gives some veteran experience to a room that is young and a little bit of the unknown due to injuries. Look, we talked about that shoebox or that shelf on the store where you would look at a young, experienced backup quarterback. We did two shows. You're absolutely right. We did virtually two full shows on the different possibilities and the different ways the Giants could go. Whether or not you wanted Trubisky or you wanted Locke or you wanted Mason Rudolph is a guy who I actually thought also would be someone who would be on my radar. Mariota was another one. Uh, Minshew, although maybe he's got a few more wins under his belt. Maybe he's a tad higher than, than that shoebox. But this was exactly the kind of guy we talked about philosophically that made sense for the Giants because they're backing Daniel Jones, and now what they've really done is they've said, okay, we're going to play roulette with Daniel Jones. Either he's healthy and he's going to be terrific, or if the rehab doesn't work out well, uh, then we've got to have an insurance policy. So to me, Daniel Jones is the, the roulette wheel. Black or red, right? Because his health is is the one thing that could move the ball from black to red. 
Now you go to the blackjack table in the casino, okay, and you say, hey, you know what? I'm going to play 21. And I got two um, two uh, aces. I'm splitting them. You've now helped your possibilities because on one hand at the roulette table, you're betting on Daniel Jones to come up healthy. And if it doesn't work out, you're now at the blackjack table and you're betting on Brian Dayball and his ability based on his resume of having great success with quarterbacks to take a young, young, experienced veteran who has done a few things in this league who came into the NFL as a projected number one draft pick, although he wound up slipping to early in the second round, but a guy who was highly, highly touted for his arm and his and his frame and his size. This is a guy who was very much liked. Also, he's very astute. He's a, he's a smart quarterback. He's a rhythm, timing quarterback as well. And you're saying, well, I'm betting on the roulette wheel with Daniel Jones, and now I'm betting on the blackjack table with Brian Dable. So I've now doubled my chances to win because if Daniel Jones doesn't get healthy and do what he's supposed to do, I've now got a young prospect of a rookie, of a, not a rookie, but a young prospect of a quarterback who I believe that Brian Dable is going to be able to bring out the best in him if necessary and potentially make him my next guy. So you've, you've doubled your bet. You've now... You've now played the roulette table and you've played blackjack. And, of course, to your point about keeping a third quarterback, now it might even make more sense to do that. Because now that you've got lock, quote, locked in, maybe maybe you just say, look, Tommy DeVito, you are going to be the third quarterback on the 53. We're not going to expose you to waivers. Maybe you decide that he's going to get scapped up. We'll just keep him on the 53. And because of the uncertainty involving either Jones's health or Locke's productivity, maybe you're comfortable with Tommy DeVito as the third quarterback on your 53, and you don't even play with trying to get him onto the practice squad. That's how I see things this morning right now. Well, if they draft a quarterback, and we've had these conversations. He's got to be on the 53. He's on the 53. And then you have to expose Tommy DeVito and you see whether or not you can bring him back to the practice squad. So now the question becomes, do you take a fourth-round quarterback or a fifth-round quarterback who will have, quote, higher upside than a Tommy DeVito? Or do you just stick with Tommy DeVito and say, you know what? I'm not going to bother drafting a quarterback at all. Maybe I'm just going to keep piling on to the line. I'm going to add a couple extra corners. I'm going to add another offensive lineman. I'm going to add another defensive lineman. Maybe you just load up on, on other positions and don't even worry about the quarterback. Maybe you got your three quarterbacks already in the house. Well, I think for this season, to answer your question, Paul, I think you have three quarterbacks because Locke definitely changes the dynamics of that room because your thinking is... Well, he's only a he's, five-year pro. Correct. He's an insurance policy, but there's potential that if he does get an opportunity, you could bring him back. However, yeah, he could be part of the future. However, if you need him, based on reports, considering it's a one year contract, I don't think, based on that structure, that it really changes the thinking of the Giants. Meaning, if they want to take a quarterback with a sixth overall pick, the lock contract does not prevent them from going in that direction. It does because he's not. not on the books long term. It does not. However, I highly believe that that's unlikely to happen. And I'm not saying that it's more likely or less likely. I just, I don't think it changes things drastically. I guess I would not read so much into the lock signing and say, oh, that means the Giants have no interest in looking at a quarterback high. I mean, you could very well say Drew Locke is your insurance policy this year and simultaneously you're developing a young quarterback. You could do both of those things. Oh, you could. Together you in could. 2024. Again, for me, I think if they do take a quarterback, it's going to be late. I don't think they're taking one at six. I think it's quite apparent right now, if you look at the Giants' two most gaping needs. Because, folks, let's recap the last few days. It appears that they have gotten two functional offensive linemen. They've gotten a dynamic pass rusher. They've gotten a young backup quarterback. Um, they've overhauled their running backs room. 
Um, they've gotten an experienced guy in the secondary to help out with depth there. Where are the two most glaring needs? Uh, it's pretty obvious. Big play wide receiver and potential starting corner. It's obvious. Where are the two deepest parts of this draft? Wide receiver uh, and also cornerback. Now, if you want a big play wide receiver, everybody seems to believe you got to get one of those three. I'm just doing the math, folks. It doesn't take a genius to, to, to figure this out, right? I mean, the draft is what you do after you fill most of your holes in free agency. And now, you know, you go after value, best player available. And, oh, if it happens to match a need, well, Romo Dunze is just sitting out there on the table for you. Or maybe neighbors. Either one. It just seems so apparently obvious to me. Well, and they'll be in position, you would think, to get one of those offensive playmakers as opposed to not necessarily being in position to get the quarterback that they would want if they stay pat at six. See, that's a big difference. I don't think you're settling on a wide receiver if you select one of those guys at six. Quarterback, you could be settling if a few of those guys are off the board. Well, yeah, because everybody believes that the top three have to go in the top three. Sure, but and that the next you may guy, not look at those guys, though, as and the that, top three, too, well, keep in mind. Again, we don't know how the Giants yeah. feel, but the, the overall general consensus seems to be top three picks or top three quarterbacks, and that's the end of that. And the fourth quarterback is going to be down the road a bit. I know that there are some people, they're in the minority, who think that McCarthy should be the fourth quarterback, and he should be a top 10 guy. Uh, I don't see it, and I certainly don't see him at six. To me, it's obvious. The value at wide receiver between Odunze and Neighbors far exceeds the value of McCarthy as, as a quarterback. I don't think that's much of a question for me at all. Then again, I don't get paid to make that decision. Well, listen, there's room for them to go in a variety of different directions at six. I just, I don't read much into one particular move in free agency. Also, you know my feelings, Paul, about the draft. It's not just about 2024. It's about mm. beyond that, too. There's a couple of names that are flashing up on TV right now. Guys like Gar Garoppolo, Joshua Dobbs. Those are those guys who'd be in that shoebox that we were talking about. Sure. Well, I mean, but the fact that they brought in Drew Locke now. They got the guy they I wanted. I would say it's highly unlikely because you just don't have the financial flexibility no, no. to make another move. I, I was simply yeah. saying those were the other guys in the shoebox. Well, they got the guy they wanted, and it's great. Sure. And it's great. It alleviates another issue. And keep this in mind, too. Several of the guys we talked about you know, got pretty good money. Whereas, and once again, they gave Drew Locke, according to reports, a one-year deal. You know, we don't need to get into the finances in that $5 million ballpark, perhaps. But, I mean, Darnold got a one-year deal for $10 million. Okay, Brissett got $8 million. Mariota oh, got $6 million. You know, these guys were not going for cheap Tyron on the free agent market. was reported to get a two-year deal from the Jets for more than he got from the Giants two years ago. Yeah. What was it, I think uh, $9 million a year or something like that? I, that's I one of the reports that I saw. So, you know, you could understand why the Giants, they may have wanted Taylor back, but they said to themselves, $9 million a year, that's a lot of money to wrap up for an insurance policy. Sure it is. And you get younger with Drew Locke. So I can understand the logic and the thinking, but... Well, I want to say Tyrod yeah. Taylor's number for the Giants last year was six, wasn't it? I believe so, yeah. So in but reality... Six versus nine... How about the fact that Different. he was six and Drew Locke is only five. And Drew's younger. And more, more healthy. Yeah. Well, and you would think, wouldn't the younger, healthier guy get the better contract? But the thing I, is, Drew Locke had a rougher start to his career. Sure. He is more unproven, does not have the wins and the pedigree that a Tyrod Taylor has. But again, you could look at it that Drew Locke may be a late bloomer. And if you believe in Brian Dable's quarterback guruship, if you will, I just created a word, like <laughs> Belichickian, guruship, right? If you believe in that, then you believe that potentially, uh, you know, if necessary, Dable can make something out of that guy. Keep in mind, Drew Locke, interestingly, has followed a very similar path to Daniel Jones, removing the injury history, though. 
he had a revolving door of coaches and play callers in Denver. No doubt. I mean, that's a big reason why I don't think he ever got to his potential. I mean, just to bring it up, Fangio was the head coach in 2019, his rookie year. Rich Scangarello was the offensive coordinator. Then, 2020, Fangio changes to Pat Shermer. And then in 2021, Shermer is still there. But then what happens in 2022? Nathaniel Hackett comes in. And remember, mm -hmm. he didn't even last the season. And, of course, they made the trade. But he had two coordinators in the span of his first three seasons in the right. NFL. And he wasn't on the field consistently. Not an excuse. Just the reality of the circumstance. And who do I use as the perfect model? Alex Smith. I mean, Alex went through, what, seven coordinators in eight years? Yeah. Now, that's rare. Normally, guys don't get that much leeway, Paul. Their careers are done. But I think that contributed to why maybe Drew Locke didn't click immediately in terms of his career. Look, here's the one thing you want to say about him and you can say about him. You want to, but you can't always say it. He's got the physical tools to play. Sure, yeah. He's got the size, the frame, the strength, the arm strength, throws a good ball. Yep. Um those those are you know if you know physically the guy has the talent and the skills and the tools to succeed well now it's all the other stuff that you have to work with that may not have been in place and forced him to try to be a late bloomer but hey you know me i'm i'm still in daniel jones's camp and i still think that daniel's going to be able to come back healthy and he's going to do a fine job and he'll hold down the starting role and they won't necessarily have a need for the backup guy. I'm still in, in the on the roulette wheel myself. Sure. But but this blackjack table that's been thrown into the room certainly helps the Giants situation. Well, because you just can't afford to go into this season. Correct. Banking Which Joe Shane has said. Jones is going to stay healthy. And he yeah. found his insurance policy. Two other recent transactions that the Giants made in addition to Drew Locke takes us to the defensive side of the ball they brought in veteran safety Jalen Mills who also has a lot of experience as a corner familiar name in the NFC East because he started his career yeah. with the Eagles spent the last three seasons with the Patriots five years with Philadelphia similar to Nick McLeod where he's interchangeable he could play corner he could play safety and you lose Xavier McKinney to the Green Bay Packers and we talked about you got younger guys now on the depth chart including Belton and Owens you do have Jason Pinnock so here's a guy you bring in to camp he competes, and if you have injuries in any of those positions, he holds value because you can emphasize we want to use you as a safety or we want to emphasize and use you as a corner. Plus, of course, he's a special teams guy as well. Well, when you're talking about a new defensive coordinator for the Giants uh, in terms of using deception as opposed to pressure to try to give offenses trouble, well, this is the kind of guy who fits into that scheme because you're looking at the versatility and the opportunity to play all over the field. Played mostly safety with the Patriots the last few years, but a guy who, by his own admission, has played nickel linebacker, strong safety, free safety, and cornerback. Known as the Green Goblin for his braids and the green that he dyes in his hair. Yep. Uh, you know... We don't have any Spider-Man at MetLife Stadium that I know of, so we'll see if he can fly around and make some plays for the Giants. Uh, but but this is a guy who is a great locker room guy. I already did some intel on him. I am told he is very outgoing. He is very gregarious. Uh, he's got a very pleasant personality. Uh, always energized and and prodding his teammates to do better at all times. He's he's a real rah rah cheerleader type, you know. I'm 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 guessing probably a lot like what Sterling Shepard has been for this team for the last several years. So you're looking at a fellow who isn't just in the Giants' minds a versatile skill set, but also an intangible that I believe they think can be useful to this team, especially given the fact that the secondary is really young. Yeah, well, and that's why. Excuse me. There's value in bringing in a safety who has that level of experience when you lose somebody like McKinney. At least you protect yourself because what do we talk about, Paul? Belton looked good in the later stages of last season, but sample size is tiny. You can't guarantee that that's going to happen for 17 games. And Owens was a special teamer last season. Yeah. So you don't really know a lot about the young guys no. at that position, right? Well, if you want to go into recent Giants history, right, Bobby McCain was signed to be that guy. Yeah. Right? Uh, remember Leon Hall? 
Sure. From the Bengals. He was signed to be that guy. During but the, he wasn't a special team or guy. He wasn't a special so team or guy. Sometimes he was inactive but, but as he, a result. But he was brought in late yeah. to be that guy to help out in the secondary. How about R.W. McQuarters, who had been a corner and a special teamer and then became a safety, yep. and they brought him in in the 2007 season, and he was a rover back there helping out the secondary. There have been a number of times where the Giants in years past have gone after a guy like this to uh, to help enhance the room. Plus, you talking about how corner is still a need, and I would agree with you. you know, maybe if they don't get what they need in free agency... Chips don't fall the way in the draft. I know he's played safety recently, but at least you have an option. And he's six for feet a veteran tall. corner, correct? He's got some size. size. So yeah. I mean, that to me, could I, be I good like too. McLeod out there to myself. Oh, man, that's between fine, the two of them, I put McLeod out there first. And there are so many corners in this draft; they should be able to get at least a couple. Well, but once again, is he going to be ready though to go out there and perform? Because remember, you got Deontay Banks on the other side, who's a young guy too. Yeah. So how comfortable do you feel in having two young guys as opposed to maybe working in a veteran? Isaiah McKenzie was the other addition, another great special teamer. I mean, the man's got a wealth of experience as a punt returner and a kickoff returner. He reminds me of Wondell Robinson. Mm -hmm. Stylistically, size-wise, I don't want to say he's a duplication of Wondell, but he's got that jitterbug, that term that you like to call He's a slot gadget player. Yeah. Now... I don't know how much they'll utilize him on offense. That remains to be seen, keep in mind. But you figure he could definitely compete with Gunnar Olszewski as a return man. Mm -hmm. And he could be somebody given certain plays or groupings personnel-wise that they turn to as an offensive weapon who can also be utilized out of the backfield. They utilize him as a runner in addition to lining up his receiver. Well, if you just want to overlay with some um, onion paper the Giants wide receiver depth chart over last year's, right? You'll figure we know Sterling Shepard, we believe, is going to retire. Uh, Campbell is not coming back. He was on a one-year deal. Yep. So you have room to draft a wide receiver at number six, and that can be whatever the rookie turns out to be. And then if you put McKenzie into Shepard's spot, you've now filled up your wide receiver room. Well, but if they draft somebody, well, they now, could, they could I mean, also the well there, is... again there could be competition. Sure, but I'm saying at the very least, if you don't come out with any other wide receivers, those are your receivers, right? I mean, you you could go into a game with with that as your wide receiver room, could you not? Yeah, no, I'm with you there, absolutely. But remember, Campbell didn't get a lot of opportunities last season, so somebody is going to be on the outside looking in. Well, I in terms of in at. terms of snaps, yeah, absolutely. Because if Odunze or neighbors get drafted at six, they are going to play. Correct. <laughs> well, because he becomes the fourth guy with the other three you name I'm simply, and then the tight ends. I'm simply talking about the slots in the room, the chairs in the room, if yeah. you will. I'm not telling you how they're going to be deployed. I'm simply saying that there were two spots on the roster at wide receiver during the entire 2023 campaign, Shepard and Campbell. Those two spots need to be replaced. Do you want to replace them with... One of the reserve guys that are on the team right now? Do you want to replace them with rookies who are drafted? Do you want to replace them with free agents? Well, I'm telling you now, if you draft a rookie at six, that's one of the spots. And McKenzie could very well be the other. And maybe somebody else gets beaten out. Who knows? But he would be a backup slot to Robinson, which... You know, you could make a case that's kind of what Shepard was. He didn't get a chance to play a whole lot, but he was kind of the backup to Robinson last year. Well, and remember, Robinson suffered a torn ACL not too long ago, so it's good to have insurance because mm -hmm. you don't know whether or not he'll hold up as well. So I think, once again, there's value to this, but I like his special teams experience. because He's a better kickoff returner than Olszewski. Olszewski was told on kickoff returns, fair catch. Don't even run it back. Let it go or fair catch. They did not feel comfortable with him on kickoff returns. Wow. They loved him on punts, and justifiably so. 94 yards for a touchdown against the Rams. Great. Outst I think he's a terrific punt return guy. For some reason, he's not really a kickoff return guy. And by telling him to fair catch everything that he could catch, they're telling you the same thing. Uh, McKenzie is a legit kickoff return guy. Averaged over 22 yards a kickoff return. Yeah, they're going to give him the green light. Of course, Unlike there were Olszewski. not a lot of kickoff returns in the game anymore. But 
No, but you know what? <laughs> hey, just like when you least suspect it, Oshevsky took advantage of the Rams missing 100 tackles. You right. never know. And that could very well be the difference between a win or a loss on the season. McKenzie also has connections to Brian Dable and Joe Shane. They were together in Buffalo. So he and Devin Singletary continue this Buffalo reunion theme that we've seen since Dable and Joe Shane came to East Rutherford, New Jersey. So those are the latest three additions to the roster. And we could also get a little bit into some of the previous additions as well. But we'll open up the phone lines. A few reminders, though, before we head to the lines. The Giants Huddle Podcast, you can check that out favorite podcast platform go to giants.com slash podcast as we look ahead to the 2024 campaign take your fandom to the next level season ticket membership stay connected to the club all year round not just on game days memberships now available for the 2024 season to learn more about all the exclusive member benefits visit giants.com slash tickets limited inventory is available and the giants official connected tv streaming app Giants TV, it brings you original video content, game highlights on demand, and direct to big blue fans. Giants TV, it's free. It's on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and the Giants mobile app. All right, let's open up the phone lines as we move forward here. We check in with Jason in New Haven. Jason, welcome to BBKL. What do you got for us? Hey, what's going on, fellas? Good. All right. What's on your mind? Good. Good. Uh, mm-hmm. I haven't heard the show in a while, but uh, um, the free agency I liked, um, I want to say... You know, good luck to Barkley and McKinney. Um, you know, they were two good Giants. Um, you know, I can't blame you, though. I know a lot of fans are probably upset, but you know how I am. Uh, these guys only have a finite window to make their money. So, um, you know, God bless them for getting every single dime they could. So I have nothing bad to say about those two. Jason, you know, they mm-hmm. both got a godfather offer. You know what that is? That's an offer you can't refuse. Absolutely. Those offers absolutely. were absolutely blowing people out of the water. And to be frank with you, you'd have to be literally like, uh, I don't even want to say how ridiculously in a coma you would have to have been to turn down <laughs> either one of those contracts. I mean, right, they were right. they were they were from Mars. Those two contracts. So, absolutely. you know what? That's it. What can you say? We always said, while I always believed that Barkley would be back, I never thought that another team would actually offer such a wild deal. And that's right. a wild deal. All if, it takes if, is one. Wow. Wow, yeah, that that was that was a big deal. And, you know, the other part of that is I'm with Shane, I mean, or Joe Shane. Um, and the, where we're at right now, I just never saw us paying twenty six million guaranteed for Barkley at twenty seven and then another seventeen million a year for a safety. And while McKinney was a good safety, it's not like, you know, no disrespect to him, but it wasn't like we're losing a Kenny Phillips or a Entrell Roll or a you know, or one of the all time great safeties. He was good, but I think we'll be okay with him. And Shane, um, you know, this is not revisions history. I'm not knocking any previous administrations, and I'm not knocking Barkley. I rooted for him every Sunday. He was a giant, and I'll have good memories of him. But Shane is just doing what needed to be done. In my opinion, Barkley, and, and this is not to knock anybody, but Barkley was the wrong pick. That's just my opinion. He was the wrong pick that year, number two overall. We weren't a running back away from winning anything. Um, so I applaud Shane for or just writing that wrong, in my opinion. Well, it's um, his vision of the team now. I mean, remember, he didn't yeah. draft Saquon Barkley, and he can now take this team in a different direction as he pleases. Right. And I think the indication is he wants to take resources and invest them in other areas of the team, Absolutely. such as the offensive line and pass rusher. And he has every right to do that. And I think most teams, if you look at the blueprint, they realize those are the areas you have to win, especially in this division. Absolutely. Yeah. And Lance, you, Lance, you did a good point of segue into my, my next point was I thought the Burns trade was a knockout the park. Uh, I know I've talked to you, Lance, and you, Paul, about we need to get back to our DNA. Our pass rush and our offensive line the last few years just hasn't been what we have been used to. And to get a 25-year-old pass rusher who I remember his days in Florida State, very athletic, can bend the corner, and it's a pretty, you know, he's not an all-world run defender, but he's a pretty good run defender. I thought it was a knockout of park for a second-round pick and a fifth. Um, now people say, oh, well, the 
you know, we gave him that big extension. Listen, you know, well, you had to. You're have to I mean, he was a free you agent. Have to pay, so. you, yeah, you have to pay to get some talent in this organization. And with him and Big Dex in the middle and Kayvon, I mean, I'm, I'm head over. I'm over the moon right now to see what. Now, of course, they have to prove it on the field. But I'm head over. I'm over the moon to, to just see those three work. And then the last point, the offensive line. Um, I thought they were really good pickups. If I'm not mistaken, I know you guys are not big PFF guys, but if I'm not mistaken, uh, Runyon is in a, was in a top ten in terms of metrics or pass protection, and I think it's safe to say that Dabo kind of wants to throw the ball, and then Illuminor mm-hmm. has some position flexibility mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. I personally think he's going to start at guard. That's just my opinion. He could. But he's if, played guard yeah. before. It's possible. Yeah, but if. But if Neil, you know, I think this is a, this is a wake up call for Neil. And I've been I've been kind of hard on him. I know he's had some injuries and, you know, maybe some coaching, maybe just some disconnection with coaching that we've had. Um, this this needs to light a spark in him. You you were the seventh or I believe seventh overall pick that year. We picked him up, and we we, we need to see some we need mm-hmm. to see some stuff on the field. So I think and we paid him a good amount. I think it was seven million a year. We're giving a Luminor, um, and then. The rest of the free agents were just out of the park and in the draft, and I'll get off the air. I'm at the point right now, fellas, it's receiver or trade down. Um, I don't see us trading up unless one of those Caleb or – well, that's the only guy we really trade up for, and he'd have to fall, and I don't see that happening. And then the receivers, Rome or neighbors, which I've mentioned numerous times, I like. And personally, I think we're at a good spot where Shane has kind of hit – Every little thing we've needed. We needed a backup quarterback. I like Drew Locke. We needed some receiver help. McKenzie is not a big name, but he's some depth. We needed a safety. We got Mills. Not an all-world safety, but he's some veteran depth. And the two linemen we picked up. Well, yeah, because, I I mean, the the goal in the draft is you don't want to have to force yourself into a position. And appreciate the phone call, Jason. Thanks for giving us a ring. We don't even need to do a show now. He just did such a great job of logically assessing what the Giants have done. We could just, like, pack up and go home. Well, great job, Jason. That was an outstanding phone call. Educated, reasonable, logical. You explained it beautifully. And I'll tell you, Illuminor, he had been a target for me since since the day they hired Brasillo. He had, I had said it on this program. No, they go back. Yeah. It made perfect sense. And, oh, by the way, what about all that stuff you read? that the Raiders' offensive lineman supposedly did not like Priscilla. You remember reading that in the papers? I did not see that. So, so, some, yeah. of the, some of the beat guys were writing that he, Priscilla was very much disliked with the Raiders, and, and you know, there were rumblings. Sources said that, uh, you know, the Giants got a guy who really rubbed players the wrong way. Oh. But what happened? What happened? One of his guys from the Raiders, who apparently is thrilled to death, if you read his Twitter, about being with the Giants, came over and followed Brasillo. So what does that tell you about these great sources that we've all heard about? Well, I'll give you another example. Great job. Darius Slay was on the Eagles last season. They brought in Matt Patricia as a consultant, and then he took on a larger role eventually as defensive coordinator. Patricia and Slay didn't necessarily see eye-to-eye in Detroit when Patricia was the head coach. And I know the Eagles season didn't end the way it wanted, but I mean, the Eagles still made the playoffs and won a lot of football games last I'm season. I'm not talking so, about the Eagles. I'm talking no, no, about I'm this giving, particular storyline no, no. that was floated out there as but, a big deal, and it's not, and it was no, not you, obviously not true. You misunderstood my point. I'm saying that was another example of people making a big deal. Oh yeah, about relationships, and it turned out to be okay. They didn't kill each other. They were able to right, coexist, right? And they played football. Al- so Aluminor, I think will, people read into that too much. Aluminor will provide competition for Neil at right tackle. That's the beauty of this. Yeah. He can provide competition, and at the very least, if Neil beats him, then God bless. The best man won, right? And then he becomes the backup, or he gets into the competition at guard, potentially, and maybe maybe gets a spot there. The beauty of this, and Runyon, you're right. By the way, Runyon's a better pass protector than he is a, a, a power run blocker. It, it does kind of show that Giants are probably going to be a little more pass-oriented as we move forward. Obviously, you know, with the way they move with, with the running backs, too. They're going to go by committee. They're not going to Well, they can with, still you know, run the football, whether they yeah, have a committee or one guy. I but really it, don't think that I don't think makes a difference. I don't think we're looking at a power run game this year. I think they're, they're clearly going to be gay, uh, gearing a little more toward the pass. But having said that, um, 
the Giants are in a spot where they really are setting themselves up to put the, the best five offensive linemen on the field. That's really where what it comes down to now. Because Illuminor provides so much flexibility that he could be a tackle or a guard. And it's like, well, where do you need him most? And he's going to be able to plug in there. They will put their best five starting offensive linemen on the field. This is a this was such a valuable signing. And it's why that for me, he was my first target on the offensive line. I know they went and they got Runyon first, but Illuminor to me provided that that plug-and-play, wherever you need them, flexibility that was incredibly valuable to me. Though I think ideally you want to find one spot for him as opposed to moving him around because then all of a sudden you're going to have guys lining up next to different people here or there. I think you want to avoid that. What does that, that have to do with anything? If he well, wins the tackle spot, that's where he plays. If he wins the guard spot, yeah, that's where he no, plays. No, no, but they also may obviously have a competition during training camp. Well, there should be. Realistic. There so, should be. So therefore, you're going to have Neil next to a guard. You're going to have Illuminor next to a guard. There are going to be some interchangeable parts. There will be at the you beginning. Would figure. Yeah. And, and so, by the time they decide who wins what, you'll know who the starting five are going to be. Sure, but you want to keep it that way is what I'm saying. Oh, you hope so. For then... You hope the majority so. of the season. You hope nobody That's gets hurt. Please. Yeah. Nobody get hurt this year. Please. Well, but to your point, he <laughs> has experience in both spots. But I, I've said this all the time. Daniel Jones and Evan Neal are in the same position. I don't really think it's a matter of bringing somebody in to light a fire under them. You'd be naive if you think those guys don't realize they have to stay healthy. They have to stay on the field. Well, Thomas doesn't need the fire, but Neal has had injuries. You're talking and, about and as, PJ. You're talking about Thomas? Who's, who are you referring to? Well, I thought you were talking about the two tackles. No, I'm talking about Daniel Jones and Evan Oh, Neal. no, no, no. Daniel yeah. Jones doesn't need a fire. Thomas doesn't need a fire. Neil has been inconsistent, and sure. he's been hurt. Well, but I think and he realizes that. you need to that. bring in competition. No, I, but I'm, what I'm saying is, is that I don't think Illuminor all of a sudden opens his lens to a point oh, where he it realizes. Makes, it makes that competition a whole well, lot more real when there's a 300-plus pounder sitting in the locker room next to you. Sure, but Neil also, I think, over his first two seasons, hasn't proven that he could stay on the field, and he's got to do that. And with, that with, if with, you don't stay on the field, you can easily lose with, a job. With all due his respect league. to Matthew Pert uh, and to Tyree Phillips, both of them have been nicked up. And trust me, starters who may be a little bit sketchy when they know that the backups really can't challenge and seize the job behind them, that registers psychologically. Well, trust I'm not trust me, that. the I'm Illuminor just... signing needs to get Evan Neal's attention. And if he doesn't uh, pay attention to that, he's making a sad mistake. No, and I don't think he's overlooking that. I'm just saying that I think if you ask Evan Neal, given his struggle to even stay on the field, forget his performance... You have to come to the realization you can't continue this trend because the team cannot rely on you if right. you can't stay on the field. It's the same thing with Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones didn't need to see another veteran come in. He understands if he can't stay on the field, they have to pursue other options. No doubt. So that's why I see the same thing for both of those players. Now, it, get, now it gets real is what I'm telling you. Yeah, no doubt about it. Joe is in Pennsylvania joining us here on BBKL. What's happening, Joe? Oh, what's happening? Drama. Uh, you, you you can't write these scripts. What's happening here with the Giants? You know, it's uh, really really exciting times again, and hopefully it can work out. Uh, where that last caller said maybe Barkley wasn't the right pick at number uh, two there or so when we drafted him. Well, it maybe he was, and maybe we would have gave him that contract, Paul. If the offensive line would have worked out years ago, it never did when we had to take that tackle from New England and, and we used all the assets to the offensive line, but it never came in place. So if it would have came in place, we'd have been able to put assets somewhere else besides always the offensive line, and we're still hoping today to get the offensive line going. You know I what the problem is, Joe? Honestly, the problem is, no matter how good your plan is, if the results don't follow, regardless of the reasons, people get all bent out of shape and get very angry mm -hmm. and then scream bloody holy high hell and tell you how dumb you were. Well, and and I, that, I, that's the shame of it because going into this past off season last year, Every football person that I talked to around the league said the Giants had done a terrific job of plugging all of their holes. This is a team that had made the playoffs, 
had plugged their holes and should have been primed to perform much, much better. Now, we knew the schedule was tougher. We knew that. And it was going to require them to pick it up a notch if they were going to maintain their trajectory. We all knew that. But because of the way that Joe Shane had dealt with the offseason, every intelligent football guy around the league said, hey, I think they're up for that challenge. And what happened? Lightning struck in 25 places and destroyed the season. And now everybody's like, oh, the Giants aren't very good. They might have to rebuild and do everything else. Because nobody cares about how good the plan was. They care about the results regardless of the circumstances. So I warn you not to get too caught up in the plan because no matter how good it looks, uh, there is always something else that could throw it awry. Well, the facts are, are there. I see the offensive line might not have only got rid of a Barkley not getting that together. If they don't get together, uh, uh, Daniel Jones, it, it didn't help him the last few years with the injuries and everything. He might be the next one out the door. Now, I did hear Runyon, they were talking about him that when he was with Green Bay early, they had him on the left side, and he really rated out well. A, a lot better, right? And then, uh, then uh, uh, due to injuries and stuff like that, they had to switch him to the right side. So yes. he's back and forth. So yeah. But uh, when we signed, when the Eagles signed Barkley, it was like a dagger going in my heart. Oh my lord, you know. Uh, but but that's what happens. That's now, the business. Right, and I understand all that, like you said, and you can't blame them, guys. I, I Like I said, it could have turned out all different if it wasn't for the offensive line. Now, well, I mean, Joe, to- the other thing that I think you're overlooking is you had a new general manager come in. And when you have a new general manager come in, you can't guarantee that they well, automatically want well, to invest in the players that were previously drafted. I, so I keep understand- that in mind, too. Well, Joe understand. wanted him back, though. No, but, he but, did but, want him but, back. Well, I'm not saying that Joe Shane didn't like Barkley, but whenever there's a new front office, they are not tied to those well, players they did not draft. Well, well, I think that's I, been I seen across the league. I know, but I think right. that's very well, overplayed. Well, what, very I'm overplayed. Say, what I'm saying, again, the culprit was the offensive line. Maybe we wouldn't have new general managers. You, you know, you know what, Joe? Well, no, I mean, no, you're Joe, talking about a million different things. Sure. Joe, Joe yeah, the, real, the real culprit in Barkley's value was the injuries more than well, anything else? Well, because had had, to... had Barkley been healthy for his entire Giants career, regardless of what the offensive line had done, I think things would have been different. But well, the injuries dramatically well, reduced his market value at 27 years old. Well, okay, now that's going to be a big question for the Eagles. I have to look at. Oh, they, hey, they, they were, forked were, it over. Yeah, that's well, their there's problem risk now. involved. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, now, before you just cut me off, I I have to go. You were talking to about not taking a quarterback, but I really think they have to really look at it if something pops their way. Because next year, a quarterback might not be available, or they might have to jump up and pay a big steep price. Now, because if Daniel Jones don't work out, and he has a very big cap hit next year, and then we have to pay Burns. Now, what I'm saying here. This year, do you guys think that so far with what we got in free agency and that we got uh, uh, losing uh, Barkley and our safety, you still think we're going to get them number threes for them? Well, I, I lost you. What are you, what are you talking, talking about? He's talking about the compensation in formula. Compensation. Well, you still think the compensation? Joe, but, Joe, but that, Joe. That formula. I know it goes yeah. by a system. But here's but the problem: the, we're not done yet. Yeah, you got to yeah, get done well, with the whole free agency period. I understand if it stays, but it's pretty close to done, Paul, because we spend all our money unless we're going to allocate more fix and things like that. We spent the most so far in free agency over one hundred and fifty thousand dollars or so. So uh, we we ain't gonna spend that big but much anymore. You you know that. I'm just saying right but, now. Well, but, the way but Joe, we are, but, but the problem is, Joe, you can't tell me, and I can't tell you what the exact formula well, is. Well, I'm just saying. So, do you think? Do you think that like Runyon and these other state deals would would mess up that them threes so far? 
I mean, it depends on production, too. You got Barkley and McKinney. I mean, they factor in a lot of different things, and they well, don't reveal that publicly. So all it, right. it's well, hard I to give you. One, I, I wouldn't, Joe, let's put it this way. Can you get through the 2024 season before you worry okay, about your 2025 picks? Okay, I was just picks? answering you know what right I'm now. I mean, uh, everything's tied in because them number threes there, if we want a quarterback, hey, they, they said Fields might go just for a number three if the Bears are going to deal him later or so. So we have the three. Well, it, That's it, it, all it, I'm saying. It's possible, it's but Justin, Justin Fields would be, though, traded potentially before this year's draft, and he wouldn't oh, be around for next oh, year anyway. Oh, so it's irrelevant. Oh, oh, how many threes I'm, you have? I, I'm not sure he would because they need somebody there. I'm not sure they'd right. get rid of well, him. Right, no, right I way. mean, listen, Joe, Joe, I understand you want to speculate, but the Bears could hold on to him. They have Tyson Bajant, though, also on the roster, who showed some flashes last season. The point is, if Fields gets moved, I would say the chances are high that it could be this year if they determine they want to take a quarterback. They could keep him as a backup, but if there's going to be a move, it would make sense after the dust settles with all these free agents that Fields gets moved this year that in all likelihood, you're not really going to be thinking about trading a third-round pick for Fields next year. So that's something that you got to take into consideration. I wouldn't get too caught up in 2025 picks. Over the cap tries to estimate this stuff as it's happening. They're saying, based on the reported signings, the Giants have added Locke, Runyon, Illuminor, and Singletary. Remember, not everybody qualifies. Street free agents don't qualify yep. for this formula. So four. The four that would qualify as the Giants losing are McKinney, Barkley, Taylor, and Ashawn Robinson. The net value of those contracts is heavier than the net value of the four the Giants have signed. So, yes, Joe, to your question, at the moment, the scale bounces in the Giants' favor. There will be some type of compensatory picks probably coming to the Giants based on what's happened so far. That doesn't mean well, it can't yeah, change. That's what I'm saying. It's Because fluid. free agency yeah. is still open. But, yes, as of now, the scale will balance in the Giants' favor. and They'll get something back. Whatever it is, we say it's still fluid. Yeah, and but it, they'll get right now. They're ahead of the they're ahead of the curve. If if that's what you wanted to know, Joe, they're ahead of the curve. But what that means is impossible to impossible determine. to. I determine. mean, it can mean a fourth. It can mean a fifth. Exactly. You know, who knows at this point? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, they got to utilize the resources they have to you know, tackle 2024 first. You know, this whole season play this Why are you worried about well, next year's compensatory? I'm with you. I mean, I mean, man, Joe, come on, relax. We need to finish. Go a have week. a pizza, will you, please? Of the 2024 offseason. Already, we're talking about the 2025 draft. Man, Coach Marvin's on the line here on BBKL. What's happening, Coach Marvin? What do you got? How you doing, Paul and Lance? Doing right. I'm stressed That's out. Good. I'm stressed out, Coach. Help me here. I hear, I, I hear you. I hear you. But you may, everything's not going to be correct. But he he made some good points, but then he go too far. You know, you know, you know, compensatory. I don't even think of those picks at all. I don't even <laughs> worry about them. Y'all should have. What you should have just said is you didn't know when you started. Talking and saying, well, it goes we try to help but, everybody. Well, that's what coach. we're saying. We're saying we don't have a definitive answer. But that's we, the honest truth. We try yeah, to help. We, don't. we try to explain as much as we can. You know, we try. Yeah. We try. Yeah, but sometimes you got to throw your cards <laughs> in there. <laughs> okay. Right. I've seen this game before and, and kind of like said, no, we're not going to go there. What do you got? What do you got for us? Um, well, real quick, uh, the first caller made some excellent points, but they're all a good point. But everybody has their own. Um, he was saying some things. I agree with 90% of it, but he's talking about Barkley. That was a wrong. I don't agree with that. When they picked Barkley, they had Odell was here. Um, Manning was here. They were working the line. So they figured that's what was going to work for them. Absolutely. Well, no question. Right. They, also, they also looked at him as a weapon, too, not just a conventional yes. running back. So exactly. That's yep. the other so, thing. Yeah. With, they didn't make that pick and say, oh, this is the, that was totally wrong. You want to say something totally wrong, pick somebody that's a fifth-round pick, I mean, has a fifth-round rating, and bring him up and pick him too. Correct. Now, that's Correct. definitely wrong. You don't know if they're wrong until they start playing. And I think Lance, or one of you said that. You don't know anything until they start playing. You don't know how the plan's going to go until you start playing. Because when you build a team, you build it and in your mind how you think it's going to go. It always ain't going to go that way. Somebody get hurt, somebody don't perform, turnovers, penalties, all these things 
you don't account for when you start putting these teams together. So, well, here's so, another quick I, I, example, by the way, which is interesting. Dave Gettleman also drafted Christian McCaffrey in Carolina. And then the next GM right. that came in sure. traded him to San Francisco. So the That's next true. GM that came in here parted ways. And understandable, Saquon hit the right. market and got a lucrative deal. But you're going to tell me the Panthers and the Giants both didn't say to themselves when they drafted Christian McCaffrey it, and Saquon right. Barkley that they were going to be weapons? Of course they did. Unfortunately, because of injuries... Because of offensive line play, they weren't able to truly maximize the value where it translated to wins. So the next general manager comes in and redefines the resources. Very similar right. results. Right. Yeah. And it's down to, and, I, and, and I'm seeing it now because I was upset yesterday, Monday. It, it was not upset, but I was disappointed. I had that Odell Beckham feeling again watching um, Barkley. And living in Delaware, I get Philadelphia news, and you know who's sure. the top of the news. It's Barkley. <laughs> um, I, I'm a good friend with Yasin Carmichael. I told you before, he's yeah. the nephew of Harold Carmichael. Monday he calls me about that move, and, and I had to talk to him about it. And my thing was, what's disappointing, I was saying at the time, at the time, what was disappointing, I was like, you know, I'm looking at the Cowboys. I'm looking at the Eagles. How those organizations continuously in the tw- in the 2000s have built their roster and they're staying competitive. They're not winning championships every year because it's hard to do, but they competitive um, rosters they have and they're making moves. and And I feel like we're we're standing still while they're making moves until they made the move for Brian um, um, Brian Burns. The, Brian Burns. Then I felt a little better. I said, okay. And now what I'm starting to feel, I don't know, but I'm starting to feel, um, Joe is saying, you know what? I'm going to put my fingerprint on this team. And what he's saying is, and I'm listening, I listened to Charlie Weiss, and I listened to Pat Curran. They hit it on the nose. And what it's saying is that the, the dollar amount was just too much for them for what they wanted to do. And so they're uh, allocating that money into other into the offensive line and into the defensive side of the ball, and especially the uh, defensive line. Mm-hmm. And they're working those two. They let Barkley go. I'm still a little hurt, but I'm not as hurt as much because I can see them what they're trying to build. And they was t- and Pat Kerwin, I agree with him because I was thinking this. He's saying they they do need a quarterback, and and I agree with you too, um, Paul. I won't do it at six. I can, I can stand fast at six, take one of the two receivers. Yep. That's what I see. Take you're, you're, one of the two receivers you're, you're, and then work your way down what you want to do from that point. Yeah, um, yeah, because the explosive now, number one receiver, the X receiver specifically, can make a big difference on this team. That's a quick impact, which could just yeah. lift, lift, lift. What do they say? A lift high tide team. lifts all boats, right? Right. You, you, you're talking to the lift, your, your two receivers you have, Hyatt, and uh, uh, um, uh, Wandell, mm-hmm. you can lift those guys' confidence because you're going to open up things for them. And you can, and, and then uh, as far as the quarterback goes, he liked the Penix, and I still like Penix if you can get him in the second round. Penix to me, I'm not going to get him. I'm not taking these guys at number six. I'm not taking JJ at no number six because I'm going to re. I feel I'm going to repeat the Daniel Jones situation because yesterday I went back and started looking at all the uh, articles on everyone on their ratings of the Daniel Jones draft. And I, and I started thinking about this show you guys are doing. Did any of us talk about Daniel Jones at that time? We didn't. And they had him rated in the top 20, but they didn't have him in, rated in the top 10. Okay, he liked them. I support him. He got a giant uniform. I'm not going to talk bad about him. I'm going to support Daniel Jones. But I also have to support the Giants and say, hey, if I can get another quarterback somewhere reasonable and without killing myself, I'm going to do it. The only way I would move up if one of the two top two quarterbacks fall, not the three, just the two. Well, and they also have to love both of those guys, though, keep in mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I right. mean, if you really but want not, the guy, then the safest bet is you move up to number one, and then you don't have to worry about anything because you know you're going right. to get the guy that you want. If you're going to make a right. move, you do that, and you could do that before the draft even starts because then you don't have to worry. If you're thinking about moving up, anything short of one, you got to wait and see how things develop in the draft. 
but but we did trade away one of our tools. I don't know how much ammunition I'm willing to give up to do that. Um, these guys can they have figured that out, but I don't know what See, that amount is. Coach, to me, to the, the tradable ammunition just went in the Brian Burns deal. Yes. Okay. Exactly. As far that's as I'm concerned, talking. that that's it. That that was you know if you had any thoughts, and there are people out there who still think the Giants should have traded up into the top three. That was never on my plate. Now, I understand it was always a possibility. Anything's possible. But I would never have advised that. And now that they've traded a two, uh, and I know the five is actually for next year, but now that they've done that, that was the big splash trade. And they got a pass yeah. rusher to do it. Right, right. And, and that's where I'm going. I said, I don't know what the value to move up. I don't want to give up a lot of access to move up to get one of those guys. I don't want to do that because they might ask for everything you got. Oh, well, sure. And I don't yeah. want to do that. I, I got to still build a team. So if I can fall back to the second round, maybe get enough and see what somebody says, if I can draft back into the bottom of the first round, maybe. That's a maybe. I'm not saying do that. That's a maybe. If that's what you're thinking, or you're gonna to have to sit in the second round, one of the quarterbacks fall to you, then you take them. If they don't, then you move on and do what you can, or go pause um, way. Yeah, well, um, I mean, listen, it, it also it also depends. And Coach Marvin, appreciate the phone call. It also depends on how they feel about Drew Locke too. You know, we were talking about that earlier in the show. I don't think the addition of Locke, considering it's a one year deal, drastically changes things. But maybe in their mind, they say, hey. If we have to choose between Locke and drafting a quarterback in the fourth round, we'll just hang on to Locke. And if Locke gets some opportunities, he impresses in practice, we'll re-sign him, and he could be that guy that we could still develop. Keep in mind, when the Seahawks made the deal with Denver for Russell Wilson, John Schneider, Russell had a no-trade clause, so he limited their options, but... Schneider, the other reason why they wanted to send Russell Wilson to Denver is Schneider wanted Drew Locke in return. That was the quarterback yes. that he was very high on that he wanted in-house with Geno Smith. So other teams have seen upside with Drew Locke. I don't know what the Giants think of Drew Locke beyond one season. But if you start saying you're going to look at a quarterback in the middle of the rounds, Drew Locke's not an old man. So I think you can compare Drew Locke with more experience to taking a flyer on a guy in the middle rounds. And if there's not much difference, you could stay pat with Drew Locke. If you want a little bit more upside, though, Paul, that's when I think you got to maybe make a move to be a little bit more aggressive. I don't see that happening. No, and I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I do think that there's a separation in terms of the school of thought there. I, um, I think... You know, Coach Marvin, who understands the game extremely well, uh, made a slew of good points. And, you know, the fact that they made their big splash deal to get the edge rusher, I, I, I just don't see how that gives them any leeway to make another splash move for a quarterback. Well, just, you probably just, have to I use don't... future assets. And Joe Shane does not seem to be the kind of guy who wants to do that. He doesn't... He. There are some GMs who are very quick to grab the credit card and either push cap money down the road or draft picks, you know, get rid of, get you know, like the Rams did when they went to the Super Bowl. Sure. And they traded a yep. slew of future draft picks for now. That doesn't seem to be the way Joe Shane wants to operate. I, I don't get that opinion of him, that he's a credit card guy. So to me, I think it's virtually impossible unless you just really mortgage a big chunk of change on a credit card, you know, far beyond what anybody would determine as rational after he just made the trade that he made for Burns. I think that's it. That's his splash. I'm bringing up just out of curiosity because Shane was there when they made the trade for Josh Allen and they had to move yes. up for him. So they gave up in that trade. They swapped first rounders, of course. There were two second-round picks that also were sacrificed. Now, they just got rid of a second-round pick yeah. for Burns. So you have one less second-round pick to move. But once again, you can use future picks, too. It doesn't always have to be 2024 assets. But just to give you an idea, he was there when they moved up. The additional sacrifice was a pair of second-rounders. It's going to take more than that to move up into the no, top I agree. three in this draft. Yeah, and because that way, wasn't moving up to number one and again, or number remember two, something, course. and I yeah. stressed this on a show last week. 
Joe Shane said time and time again how important it was he had four premium picks in the first 70 of this draft. Now he's only got three. When he, when he continued to hammer that point home about four premium picks, you know how much he valued those, how much it hurt him, like a gut punch, to even trade one of those. But he did it to get the edge rusher, who he clearly believed was a significant need on this team, and he was willing to take the plunge to do it. And by the way, about Burns, the thing about Burns, they now have a Batman and Robin, okay, with Thibodeau and Burns. If you had waited, for those who say, because they traded the two and they traded a five, which is really what they got in terms of price range for Leonard Williams, all right? Burns being a more dangerous outside edge rusher, he plays a different position, but he's also younger. Yep. Right? So Coming off a rookie deal. That seems yeah. like, in terms of compensation, that's a, that's a really good deal for the Giants. Okay? Now you say, well, but now they also got to give him a contract. Well, here's the thing. Let's say you, in all honesty truly believed that you were going to try to sign Burns at the end of the season because he was going to be free. Let's just say you wanted to do that. Chances are you were going to probably pay more than what you paid for that contract now. That's also assuming he does hit the market too. Carolina could have traded him elsewhere. Correct. And then he doesn't. And then, then you never get a shot at him. But yeah. if you want, if you want to go purchase a potential double digit sack pass rusher, what do you think the market is for those guys? And do you really think it's going to go down? No, well, I think the reason why... It's not! Interestingly, you bring up this topic, I would say the reason why Carolina did not get a first-round pick is because teams said to themselves, mm. we have to work out a new deal with Brian Burns. Oh, and if, and that's a discouraging thing for a lot of folks. Oh, it's significant. You because know? you would say a team is more willing to give up a higher pick if they say... We're acquiring a guy that's on the books. He's on certainty. For several years. No question. Yeah. But see, Joe Shade said to himself, look, if we really need to go out and get a pass rusher, we are going to have to pay through the wazoo. You're going to have to pay at least the cash that you gave Burns in this extension, if not more, if you have to go out to the open market and get a guy who has that type of pass rush ability, who is young, and who is healthy. It's going to cost you at least that much, if not more, in terms of cash out, outlay. So, no, I, I, I think the deal is a really smart deal for Joe. I will also say this. I would have preferred, I would have preferred that Burns had more than one double-digit sack season in his four-year career. He's gone to two Pro Bowls, yep. but he's only had 12 and a half sacks once. All the other years he was under 10. The thinking is that there's a very strong possibility he's got more 10 sack plus seasons left in him. That that he's only now getting to his prime and he's only now reaching the zenith of what he could be. So, and as the case with all pass rushers, you always have to overpay. There's an overpay premium on every pass rusher. Guys who get eight sacks, you got to pay them like they get 10. You just do. That's the way it is. Well, Daniil Hunter, who just signed with the Texans is older than Brian Burns, has many more double-digit sack seasons, mm -hmm. had a career year in 2023, 16 and a half. Houston gives him a two-year deal reportedly worth $49 million. It could go as high as 51. I mean, do the math. I mean, that's about $25 million per year in average annual salary. And Hunter is older. He's got more mileage than Brian Burns. Exactly. So if that's what Hunter is going for at this stage in his career, you can only imagine what a younger guy who was set to be a free agent. And you believe has you. ups. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's just, that's the nature of the market. The other thing, by the way, before we wrap up here about the running back oh, position. Oh, yeah, we're really long. Oh, we're okay. We're four minutes over. Trust me, we've gone much longer in the past. I think the reason why running backs are getting a little bit more money overall than last year, I don't think teams value this draft class as high as they did last season. And I think they say to themselves, if we can't get a playmaker in the draft, we'll spend a little bit more money. And that perhaps helped a guy like Saquon Barkley. Because what's the old story, Paul? If the smaller deals all go up, then the guy at the top who could cash in, right. he'll benefit as well. Yep. I think that perhaps played a role. Well, that is going to wrap up Wednesday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live here on Giants.com as well as the mobile app. 
A reminder that you could check out the show of today's episode, part of the Giants platforms everywhere and Giants.com slash podcast. For Paul Dottino, I'm Lance Meadow. Stay locked to Giants.com for all the latest. We'll speak to you on Thursday right here on BBKL. Have a good one. You deserve to treat yourself, so turn your tax refund into a U-fund and give yourself a Straight Talk Wireless Extended Silver Unlimited plan and get a new Samsung Galaxy A14 on them. You can get a great everyday value on wireless with Straight Talk's unlimited plan starting at $25 a line per month for four lines. You'll save so much, you'll be enjoying that refund all year long. It's the refund that keeps on refunding. Find Straight Talk at straighttalk.com or at your local Walmart store. Taxes and fees not included. Offer valid through 41424 while supplies last. Online only. Must purchase a Straight Talk extended Silver Unlimited plan to qualify. Limit of five phones per customer. Family plan discount with four lines all on the Silver Unlimited plan. Not combinable with auto pay discount. Your getaway with Apple Vacations begins the moment you step on board one of our exclusive nonstop vacation flights. Escape the ordinary with packages starting at just $599. No layovers, just pure relaxation from takeoff to touchdown. Immerse yourself in the joy of travel with Apple Vacations. Your journey is as enchanting as the destination, so pack your bags and leave the rest to us. Visit AppleVacations.com or call your local travel advisor to book your vacation.